Oh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Online Causal Inference Seminar. So today we have the pleasure of having two speakers. Uh, and we have a little bit of a Stanford crowd uh, here today. So we'll have the first speaker, Tim Morrison. We'll be speaking on optimality and multivariate tiebreaker designs. And then we'll have Harrison Lee talking about a general characterization of optimal tiebreaker designs. In Q&A, we actually have uh, Art Owen, Owen, who will help with uh, some questions and bring up some uh, interesting points to the speakers. Uh, Art is also a longtime patron of this seminar, so we'd like to thank him at the start. Uh, yes, uh, today's questions will be handled by Ying, so I'll uh, give it over to her so she can fill you in on how that works. Thank you, Emma. Um, so just as before, please submit your questions uh, in the Q&A section. It is a button just at the bottom of the Zoom window. So please submit the questions to the Q&A so we can keep better track of it. Um, today, maybe the time for uh, the questions is a little bit limited. So um, if you have questions, just submit it. Yeah, that's it. I think it's your stage, team. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, can folks see this okay? Yes. Wonderful. All right. Um, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction and uh, also for the invitation to speak today. Um, so as Emma mentioned, uh, I'm a second year stats PhD student at Stanford, um, and I'm excited to talk today about uh, tiebreaker designs. And this is uh, joint work with Art Owen uh, who is uh, manning the chat today. Okay, um, so let's start by uh, talking about some motivation for our setting. Um, so we consider an experiment meant to estimate the effect of a binary treatment. It's a very sort of fundamental problem. Um, but of course, in many settings, uh, there are constraints on how exactly you can assign this treatment. Right? So for example, you could imagine these constraints might be ethical in nature. Um, so maybe you know, a hospital has to be particularly sensitive about this. Um, likewise, a university assigning, say, a scholarship or financial aid. Uh, but it could also just be economic constraints. So a business might decide that they're interested in estimating some treatment effect, but you know they don't want to just haphazardly assign treatment. They want to make sure that they're still getting some measure of profit or outcome of interest. Uh, and so broadly speaking, um, we can identify two competing objectives at play. So on the one hand, there's an efficiency criterion which is that increasing randomization can help uh, estimate the treatment effect more efficiently. Right? This is sort of usually our primary goal in causal inference. Um, but on the other hand, there's something that uh, we might call the short-term gain criterion, which is that some subjects will benefit more from treatment. Um, so in this work, we're motivated by the scenario in which um, both criteria are very much uh, of interest. Okay, um, so now let's set up some notation. Uh, so I'll start by talking about the univariate setting. Um, so subject I has some running variable real value X sub I, uh, which is from some distribution P sub X. And without loss of generality, we'll just take P sub X to be mean zero. Uh, they have some response or outcome variable of interest, Y sub I. Um, and then an indicator variable Z sub I, which is plus or minus one, uh, for whether they receive treatment or not. And so we can't, uh, as the experimenter, do anything about P sub X that's inherent to the subject population. But we can choose the treatment probability P of X, which is the probability that ZI equals one, the probability of getting treatment uh, conditional on one's covariance, right? so the propensity score. Um, and so we're gonna define two terms uh, here. So we're gonna say that a randomized control trial or an RCT is where P of X is a half for all subjects. All right, so uh, we don't even look at the covariate. Um, and we're gonna define a regression discontinuity design or an RDT as p of x equals uh, well, it's one if the running variable is above some threshold t, and it's zero if it's below the threshold t. Right? So you could imagine that, uh, at least intuitively, an RCT is probably better for the efficiency criterion, um, whereas an RDD is probably better for the gain criterion, at least if we think that high values of the running variable will be associated with high values of the outcome. Um, so yeah, tiebreaker designs very simply just interpolate between these two extremes. Uh, via the following treatment probability. So P of X is one if X is above some upper threshold T sub one. 
uh, it's zero if it's below some lower threshold t sub zero, um, and it's a half in the middle. All right, so again, perhaps we can't randomize fully, um, but maybe we can randomize in the middle, so to speak, and this is sort of a natural way of encoding something like this. Uh, and so this is the nice interpretation that it's an RGD when T0 equals T1, when there's no in error region. Um, and it's a randomized control trial when T0, T1 is plus or minus infinity, uh, or more generally, as long as P sub X lives in the randomization window. Um, and for simplicity, I'm just gonna take T0, T1 to plus or minus delta for some delta greater or equal zero, which I'll call the size uh, of the randomization window. Uh, so here we just have a visualization of what's going on. So uh, these data are all generated from the same uh, generative model. Um, the green dots are treated and the black dots are untreated. So in the top left, you see an RDG where uh, everyone above some cutoff is treated. Um, the bottom right is an RCT where everyone is just 50-50. And then as you increase delta, you increase uh, the window in which there is this 50-50 randomization going on. Um, so in 2020, uh, Owen and Varian um, studied uh, these tiebreaker designs uh, under the uh, univariate two-line model uh, of uh, the following, which is that y sub i uh, is a linear function of covariates uh, where uh, the tree group has its own slope and intercept and the control group has its own slope and intercept. Right? So pretty simple intuitive model um, where the noise terms are almost canastic um, and p sub x, the distribution on x that they looked at uh, they looked at uniform and at standard normal, again, uh, pretty simple. Um, and they found, uh, perhaps intuitively, a monotone trade-off between efficiency and short-term gain as we vary the size of this window. And so what are these two uh, criteria? Well, the efficiency criterion is the variance as a function of delta, the size of the randomization window, of tau hat of x, the estimated treatment effect, um, which in this case is just the expected outcome for the treated minus the expected outcome for the control, which is uh, works out to twice beta hat two plus x beta hat three. Um, and then the gain criterion, um, well, it's the difference in expected outcome for an RGD minus for that given tiebreaker. All right, so the efficiency increases as you increase the randomization window and the gain decreases as you increase the randomization window. Um, similarly, uh, I won't talk as much about this, but uh, Kluger and Owen um, show a similar result for efficiency um, in a kernel regression. Uh, so this is just a figure uh, reproduced from uh, Owen and Varian 2020. Um, so on the x-axis, we have uh, x, and on the y-axis, we have the variance of tau hat of x. And this is for uniformly generated covariate. Um, and these sort of contours are as we vary delta. So the top contour is uh, an RTD, delta equals zero, but has the worst variance. Uh, and the bottom is an RCT, uh, delta equals one, which has the best variance. Right? And so you can sort of modulate very naturally by varying this parameter. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna talk about um, our setting, which is multivariate tiebreakers. And so, you know, in many, in many settings, in many applications, uh, there's not so much a clear running variable as there is some vector of covariates X of I, which is gonna live in R to the D. Um, and so as before, we assume that XI is from some distribution piece of X um, with mean zero, and we're just gonna assume positive definite sigma. And so, you know, we work with the sort of natural extension uh, to the multivariate setting where again, yi is, uh, has an intercept for the uh, treated and intercept for the control and different slope coefficients for the intercept for, for the treated and control. And again, epsilon i is almost scholastic ID. Uh, so our sort of quantity of interest, uh, which in this case is a vector, is gamma tilde, which is gamma zero gamma. So this is the vector of treatment effects. Um, and notationally, I just use a tilde here to denote that we're sticking the intercept inside, which is something I'm gonna do throughout. Okay, so now we have to decide how we're gonna assign treatment. Um, it's not as straightforward as before, but we're just gonna use uh, the next simplest thing, which is a linear function of the vector valued covariates. Um, so of course, we don't assume that the treatment effect gamma is actually known. So instead we consider uh, treatments of the following form. Uh, P of X is one, if X transpose eta is above some threshold delta, it's zero if it's below negative delta and it's one half in the middle. Um, and so what is eta? Well, it's whatever vector we choose to treat on, right? It need not equal gamma. In fact, it probably won't equal gamma because we don't actually know gamma. Um, one thing you can do, for instance, is estimate gamma from some prior data, get some gamma hat and use that. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some other um, consequences of some other choices as well. 
Okay, so the model is uh, as before as this. And so um, we're gonna, it'll help us if we get some uh, matrix notation in here. So we'll let D be the diagonal matrix uh, whose entries are Z. So plus or minus one for whether you get treated. Um, then in matrix form, we can write Y as uh, U delta plus epsilon, where U is uh, X tilde. So again, X with the intercept and then D X tilde. Um, and delta is sort of the stacked vector of all of the coefficients. Um, so this will just sort of make uh, things easier notationally. And I want to emphasize that uh, this matrix U is random, even conditional on X, because it still has the Z's in there, the treatments. Okay, um, so if we take a uh, variance of delta hat, conditional on X and Z, right? So this is variance of beta hat, then the two covariances, and then variance of gamma hat, um, which in turn is sigma squared times uh, the block matrix of blocks of U transpose U inverse. And so uh, the sigma squared is just sort of a multiplicative factor that shows up everywhere. It's not going to affect any comparisons. So without loss of generality, we'll take it to be one. Um, and so we need an efficiency criterion for gamma hat uh, based on the covariance matrix, the variance of gamma hat, which is the bottom right submatrix of U transpose U inverse. And so, you know, when you're looking at efficiency criteria based on a matrix, there are many reasonable choices. Um, we settle on one based on deoptimality, which is sort of a classical choice, um, which I'll define. Uh, right now. So uh, we say that the design is prospectively deoptimal for gamma hat um, if it minimizes the determinant of the expected value of U transpose U inverse and then the bottom right submatrix of that. Right. So deoptimality, you typically see, you know, determinant of X transpose X inverse or U transpose U inverse. Here we need to add another expectation in uh, because there's still randomness that we need to marginalize over in X and Z. Um, so I just sort of one thing to note is that we've sort of conveniently stuck the inverse outside of the expectation. Uh, that makes things considerably easier. Um, and it turns out also that this is equivalent to maximizing the determinant of expected value of U transpose U, uh, which is easier to work with and think about. Um, so we're going to consider that as our efficiency criteria. Um, so right away, we have the following uh, very nice and intuitive result, which is that under the multivariate two-line model, um, the RCT, P of X equals a half, is prospectively deoptimal among all designs, PX, and moreover, it is the unique optimal design among tiebreakers. So any design, not just the tiebreaker, um, it is de prospectively deoptimal and it is unique among tiebreakers. Uh, and why is that? Well, we can see it at least intuitively if we write this out. So the expected value of, I'm just gonna stick a one over N inside, one over N times U transpose U, um, we can break that up into the different blocks um, and we end up with uh, sigma on the diagonal and this other matrix N on the off diagonal. Um, and so it turns out if you want to maximize the determinant of this, which is our efficiency criterion, um, then it turns out that uh, we need this matrix N to be zero. Um, and given the form that N takes, you can show that that occurs for an RCT and for no other tiebreaker. All right, so uh, pretty nice property. Um, okay, so now that we have sort of the definition, let's start sort of thinking about how we might gain some intuition about this. Um, so let's look at perhaps the most straightforward case, which is a Gaussian. So Xi is a normal zero sigma. Um, and so the efficiency you can compute of a tiebreaker with randomization window of size delta is given by the following form. So the determinant of expected value one over n u transpose u is, uh, well, the determinant of sigma squared is a constant, so we'll ignore that. Um, and then we get one minus two over pi times this negative exponential squared, right? Um, so right away, we can see some uh, observations about this that are fairly intuitive. Uh, so the first is that higher delta gives you higher efficiency. Um, not only that, but it, the efficiency sort of increases uh, exponentially, or the term that you subtract decays exponentially. Uh, and then the other thing is that um, if we were just looking for the most efficient choice of eta, uh, well, that corresponds to minimizing that quadratic form in the numerator, or in the denominator, sorry, which is eta transpose sigma eta. Um, and if you want to minimize that, you would take the smallest eigenvector of sigma. Right. And so, you know, I like this idea because I think it, it lends some intuition to what's going on, which is that um, if all you care about is efficiency, um, you should treat on the least informative aspect of the distribution, right? Which is sort of, if you think about this in terms of like principal components, um, the smallest eigenvector would be the least informative. Um, so the other end of uh, the trade-off that I talked about is this idea of short-term gain, um, which in this case is, uh, expected value of zi xi transpose gamma, right? It's the expected um, different uh, expected treatment benefit. Um, and so for a tiebreaker, uh, 
things get a little thorny because we have this eta gamma discrepancy, but uh, if eta equals gamma, uh, then gain decreases as we widen the randomization window. Uh, and so in particular, an RGD is, is optimal. Uh, and again, for Gaussian, we get the following form. Uh, T is some constant times this ratio of quadratic forms times uh, this negative exponential, right? And so uh, in contrast to what we saw earlier, um, the best eta for maximizing gain is actually the true gamma, right? So if we knew the true treatment effect, that would be the best thing for gain, whereas for the efficiency, uh, the best thing is sort of the thing that looks at the distribution the least in some sense. Um, okay, so uh, why don't I uh, pause briefly here for questions, if there are any. Um, there's no online uh, questions, so I can hear. Okay, great. Uh, sorry. Um, okay, so now um, we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and look at sort of a, a different variant of the same problem, um, which is that uh, we consider the problem of picking fixed probabilities, little piece of i, which is the probability of being treated, um, given fixed data. So now we're not modeling the randomness in x, piece of x, we're just assuming that we have this fixed population of x's, um, and now we want to fit these probabilities. Um, and so if you remember this matrix U is, we can break it up in terms of its rows. So we have U is U sub one of Z1, U sub two of Z2, et cetera. Um, where U sub I of one, which we'll call U sub I plus is XX. Um, and U sub I of negative one, which we'll call U sub I minus is X negative X. Right? And that's because this matrix U is X. And then uh, the second block is X times the, the diagonal treatment matrix. Okay. Um, so if we take uh, p sub i plus to just be p sub i and p sub i minus to be one minus p sub i, um, then the determinant of expected value of u transpose u, in, uh, u transpose u, which is our efficiency criterion, we can break this up as a sum over 2n of these rank one matrices uh, in terms of pi ui plus ui plus transpose and one minus pi ui minus ui minus transpose. Um, and so, you know, why is this a good thing to do? It's because if we want to maximize the determinant, we could equivalently minimize the negative log of the determinant, uh, which is convex in the probabilities, right? And so this gives us a very natural way of computing this very efficiently. Um, and more importantly, uh, we can now add constraints uh, that align with the constraints that we saw earlier, right? So what are some additional convex constraints that we might consider? Uh, well, one is a budget constraint, right? So uh, perhaps say, you know, an airline has finding the many seat upgrades to give out or the university has finding the many scholarships, et cetera. This is a monotonicity constraint, uh, which could arise in either ethical or econo economic situations, right? So maybe you decide that your scholarship probability needs to be monotone in uh, GPA or income or you know, whatever um, metric that you think is reasonable. Uh, and then there's a gain constraint, which is that the expected gain um, is at least some fraction rho of its max possible value, right? So uh, here, the max possible value is the uh, gain, expected gain for an RDD. And so you're saying, I want at least some fraction of that. And so perhaps a company is willing to give up 20% of its maximum, say, um, to randomize a bit more, something like this. Okay, um, so now let's uh, apply this to uh, sort of a, synthetic example based on this uh, MIMIC data set. Um, so the MIMIC database contains data on emergency department patients. Um, and so patients come in and they present with an array of vital signs, heart rate, body temperature, blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and their triage, uh, which is to say that they're assigned sort of levels of urgency of care. Um, so perhaps, you know, the intensive care unit or something lesser, um, via what's called an acuity score, which is the score between one and five that's given to them where one is the most severe and five is the least severe. Um, and, you know, it may be a very reasonable question of interest to say, you know, what is the treatment effect of being sent to the ICU versus not being sent to the ICU? And of course, obviously for various ethical reasons, you cannot possibly um, randomize fully or, or anything like that. Um, but maybe you can say randomize in the middle or something like that, um, in which case something like a tiebreaker framework might be reasonable. Um, of course, that being said, I'm not a doctor. This is all, you know, just sort of a hypothetical example to illustrate. Um, nonetheless. Um, so we implemented this uh, convex optimization approach um, with the vector eta of treatment effects uh, fit by logistic regression of the acuity scores. Um, so somewhat coarse, but um, uh, say ones and twos are severe and threes, fours, and fives are not severe for the binary outcome. Okay, um, and we get the following um, 
outcomes. So let's uh, start by looking at the top left. So all of this is with the treatment constraint set to 0.2. So on average, 20% of people uh, get treated, get sent to the ICU. Um, and the gain constraint I said it's at 70% of its max value, right? Um, so in the top left is just the treatment constraint. Um, and you see that, you know, a number of uh, subjects are thresholded to zero and one, and there's some quite a bit of randomness in the middle still. Um, as we move down to the bottom left, so that's the treatment and gain constraints. What you see is that uh, it sort of pushes uh, the treatment probabilities closer to what you might consider closer to an RDD. So uh, people with a lower value of the running variable are pushed to zero and people with a higher value are pushed to one. And of course, as you increase the gain constraint, this would become more extreme. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we add this monotonicity constraint. Um, and this sort of this interesting uh, discrete level phenomenon, which I, I won't talk about because uh, you're gonna hear quite a bit more about that in Harrison's talk. Um, and then as we go to the bottom right and add all three constraints, well, it looks a lot like the top right plot, except again, you see this phenomenon where it's pushing uh, values on both sides closer to zero and one, right? Um, so again, this is you know fairly straightforward to implement, uh, provided that the constraints are convex. You could, of course, imagine a whole array of other constraints that you might consider besides the ones I've talked about, depending on your particular problem. Um, but you know, very natural way of, of maximizing efficiency subject to whatever constraints are, are, are at play. Um, and here is uh, sort of the same example, but just with the uh, more traditional tiebreakers that I talked about before, where you only have this one parameter delta that you vary. Um, and so, on the left, uh, this is the log efficiency as you uh, increase delta. You can see you know, pretty drastic increases even at the beginning. Um, and on the right is the decrease in short-term gain. And so you, know, you might look at something like this and decide um, based on what you're willing to give up in gain, you know, where you're willing to, to set the randomization window. OK, um, so just to summarize, uh, so there are many, many experimental settings uh, that uh, present practical constraints on design decisions. Um, and so even when uh, full randomization is infeasible, as it often is, um, there can still be much to gain by randomizing sort of in the middle, as it were, where that's going to depend on the context of the problem. But um, nonetheless, tiebreakers provide a simple mechanism to trade off between efficiency and gain um, when these constraints are present. Um, and in addition, if you consider the, the fixed design problem, um, there's a very nice analog in terms of convex optimization that makes this very easy to solve. Um, all this being said, of course, there are many other areas for further exploration. Um, so for example, you might think of moving beyond the two-line model, moving to more general tiebreaker designs, things of that sort. Um, so I'll take uh, any questions uh, right now, if there are any. Um, there are a few questions in the chat, mm -hmm. but uh, our hands are not a great job addressing them. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, why don't I just uh, do this first then? So. Um, just uh, acknowledgements. So again, I want to thank the uh, organizers of uh, the seminar for the invitation and uh, for the wonderful series. Um, I want to thank Harrison Lee and Dan Kluger for the uh, for some comments and feedback, and of course thank Art for collaboration and for uh, manning the chat today. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions now. Yes, Art. Actually, oh, um, <laughs> so there was a. Actually, I was reaching for the applause button and I got the, mm -hmm. hint, the zoom in. But but the the question that was coming up was from Ching Wan, and he was wondering mm -hmm. about um, you know what statistical model efficiency was calculated under, um, and then you might so maybe you can say something about um, how that works and how it's different from potential outcomes. Um, sorry, can you repeat the what what models? Oh, so he was he was asking, like, is the efficiency computed under the randomization distribution or under the linear model? And I may uh, have answer to that, but maybe you want to say more. Yeah, good question. So the the randomization is um, with respect to x and z. So you you don't actually need the um, th there's no y's. I mean, you you're assuming, of course, that the linear model holds because um, that's how you derive the you know this matrix you transpose u is. Um, uh, that's that's where that arises from is from the variance of the OLS, um, but uh, the the randomization is entire entirely with respect to X and Z. Okay. Great, uh, wonderful. Are there any follow up questions, perhaps? Can I ask a follow up question? Is yeah, there sure. can you provide some intuition for why the uh, 
the, the randomized controlled trial is uh, the most efficient. I, I think you went over it quite quickly and I just- Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean like in, um, in, in this slide you mean? Uh, or just in general? Yes, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, mathematically, um, it has to do uh, just with this, uh, this formula and the fact that this off diagonal matrix N, um, if you compute it out, um, you'll see that it's it's zero for an RCT and nowhere else. Um, uh, intuitively, why is that? Um, it's because, uh, you know, you sort of get expressions with like 2p minus one and 2p minus one is, of course, always, you know, you get expected value of 2p minus one times something else, which is zero when p is a half. Um, but, you know, intuitively, um, you know, if you think of RCT as like the gold standard, for, for randomization, um, it's most efficient because you're you're sort of sampling treatments from the entire space equally likely. Um, and so you're not sort of upweighting or downweighting anything like that. Um. Great. Um.